Hi, if you've not met me before, I'm Joth Hunt. I'm one of the regional ministers for Southern Counties Baptist Association. And thank you for this opportunity to share with you. We live, of course, in strange times at this moment. So to share in this way through video uh, is such a privilege and such an honour. So thank you for taking time uh, to watch this sermon. And thank you for allowing me to be part of your service today. It wasn't long ago that uh, I woke up pretty grumpy. Uh, I can do that quite, quite a bit from time to time. But particularly around this time of year, the clocks had been turned back. The weather was terrible, the nights were drawing in, and it's a time of year when I just get rather grumpy. But that moment, or that morning, in my devotions, one of the readings that I turned to was the verse in Philippians 4, verse 4, where Paul writes to the Philippians and says to them, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I must admit I felt rather chastised and corrected. But since then I've been pondering, particularly in this time of lockdown, this time where we're entering into the winter, uh, where the nights are drawing in and many of us feel quite disillusioned, disappointment, even sad uh, in this season. I've been pondering what it means to rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. So I want to look at that verse in, in its context in Philippians 4 as I share with you for the next few minutes. So let me read those verses to you that are taken from Philippians 4 and if you've got a Bible nearby you may want to turn to these verses and I just want to read from uh, chapter 4 verse 4 through to verse 9. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. As I reflected on Philippians particularly and these verses, it suddenly dawned on me that the letter to the Philippians is very much a letter for lockdown. In fact, it was written in lockdown. Paul was in prison. We're not sure exactly where, probably Rome, but others think he may be in prison somewhere else writing this letter. It doesn't really matter, but what we do know is that he was in prison. Also, when you go right back to the beginning of the church of Philippi, what we discover is that it was actually founded with Paul and Silas being in prison. In Acts 16, we read that uh, Paul and Silas, because they have challenged uh, the economy through a young girl, the use of a young girl, they, uh, they are thrown into prison. And uh, it's recorded there that at midnight they are singing praises and praying to God and rejoicing in who God is. And then at that moment an earthquake takes place. And the jailer thinks that everyone has escaped, but Paul makes sure that each prisoner did not escape. And instead of losing his life, the jailer gives his life to Jesus. And Luke records for us that him and his whole household are baptised. This is the beginning of the church in Philippi. A church that is founded in lockdown, where God breaks them out of lockdown, breaks them out of prison, and he's a church emerges in rejoicing and celebration. 
kind of dawns on me that if this is such a book, a, a church founded in lockdown, a, a, a letter written in lockdown, there is much to be said to us in this moment. Not that our situation or circumstance is the same as theirs, but we can learn what it is to be Christians in a moment of trouble, difficulty, and where we're restricted in our activities. When Paul writes those words to the Philippians, he's coming to the end of his letter to them. Uh, in fact, the NIV entitles it Final Exhortation. But actually, it's not just a final exhortation, it's also a summary of much of what he's been trying to say to them through his letter. And what he does is he has these two sections, verses six, four to six, sorry, four to seven and eight to nine. And he uses really pithy short statements to make his point. And in that first section, which we're going to focus on particularly, those first few verses, he uses three commands and two promises that he embeds into those commands. So I want to look at those three commands together, but also reflect on the promises that go alongside them. And the first command is this. The first command is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If someone turns to me, particularly when I'm feeling pretty discouraged or sad or fed up, and says to me, oh, cheer up, I must admit I find that quite difficult to receive. And you might be similar to that as well. But when the person is a person who finds themselves in a place of suffering, like Paul was, he was the one that was in prison, he was the one that was suffering, he was the one that probably had every right to feel discouraged and disappointment, dis disappointed. When someone like that turns and says, rejoice in the Lord, I think that is worth listening to. I'm quite a fan of Michael Palin's documentaries and I was watching his journey through the Sahara and I was struck particularly when he visited a family that, that lived in this makeshift house and had done for many decades because of the war between Morocco and the, and the southern area. And that these people had been exiled from their land for, as I say, a number of decades. And when he visited them, this family just had a huge smile on, it, on their face. And, and he asked them at one point, why are you so joyful? And the answer that came back is because God has been so good to us. God has been faithful and generous. That's such a challenge, isn't it? When someone says that, when you can see that they have every reason to be fed up and sad and they are able to rejoice. Gordon Fee, in his commentary on this passage, uh, says this. He says, Joy unmitigated, untrammeled joy is, or at least should be, the distinctive mark of the believer in Christ Jesus. We as Christians are often known to be pretty grumpy, and I've met some Christians that are a bit like that. But we shouldn't be. Because of what Christ has done for us, because of his coming, because of his, his teaching, because of his death and resurrection, because we discover faith and grace and salvation and a promise of eternal life in him, that should put a smile on any Christian's faith, face. We should be people that are filled with joy, that overwhelms inside of us. Not ignoring the fact that there are challenges in life and moments when we should cry with those that cry and lament with those that lament. Yeah, but all those things should be held in balance. But there should be this deeper sense of joy that wells up inside us because God is good, God is gracious, and God has brought his salvation to us. It's interesting that Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't just say rejoice for the sake of rejoicing. Our focus is to be upon Jesus. I was reminded of that old-fashioned chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
It's when we focus on him that we discover that he is our everything. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our joy. And we can rejoice in him again and again in all circumstances. Paul's second command in verse 5 is to let your gentleness be evident to all. Most people, many people, would be able to memorise and recite the first command, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. But I expect a lot of people would not be able to tell you what the verse is that follows that. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And I must admit, when I first looked at this verse, I did think these two things are a little bit strange sitting alongside each other. Rejoicing and gentleness. How do they come together? But if you stop and think about it, if our rejoicing is in God, if our rejoicing is in Jesus, then one of the things that result from that is our gentleness to others. Or think about it the other way. If we're grumpy, if we're a person that is annoyed and fed up all the time, the outflow of that is that actually we will become angry with others, that we will become defensive of our own position, that we will become judgmental of others. But what Paul says is that if we are rejoicing in the Lord, in Jesus Christ, the outflow of that is that we are gentle, that we care for people. The, the actual meaning of this word is, is a sense of forbearance. It encapsulates things like caring and compassion and kindness and goodness towards others. Because God has been so good to us and we rejoice in that and we're thankful for it, the overflow of that is towards others. That we will be kind, that we will be compassionate, that we will be caring, that we will be reaching out, that they might too receive the joy of the Lord in their lives. So hot on the heels of Paul's first two commands, to rejoice and to be gentle to others, he puts in this little pithy statement a promise that the Lord is near. Now there's a lot of discussion as to why he does this and exactly what does he mean? Does he mean that the Lord is near in the sense that the Spirit of God is with us, that God is journeying alongside us and therefore we can be encouraged? Or is he meaning that the Lord is coming soon? Well, we could spend a huge amount of time thinking about that, but we probably wouldn't get very far. In fact, it probably doesn't matter. Both are applicable. If Jesus is with us, then rejoice. Rejoice and be compassionate and loving and caring to all those around you. But if Jesus is coming, well, that also should put a huge smile on our faces and should drive us, should motivate us in our love and compassion for others. I'm going to be a typical Baptist and sit on the fence on this one. But I don't think it really matters. The truth is this. The Lord is near, so rejoice. The Lord is near, so be gentle. The Lord is near, so do not be anxious, which is his next command to the Philippians. So after that wonderful promise that Paul wrote, that the Lord is near, he goes on to his third command, which is do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We all know that Christians are to be prayerful people. We should be people of prayer. It should be the bread and butter of our life, the air in our lungs. But I've yet to meet a Christian who has said to me that they find prayer easy. We all find prayer difficult. But it is something that we should do, both individually but also together. And Paul encourages the believer, the Philippian church, 
to be prayerful, to come before God regularly with their prayers and their petitions, their requests of their hearts, but also to do it with thanksgiving. When we come in prayer, we come as faithful people. And it would be strange for us to come and offer God our prayers and then leave with anxiety deep in our hearts and souls. That's not the purpose of prayer. We come to God in confidence, knowing that God will listen to our prayers, knowing that he's a loving father that wants to know what is deep in our hearts, wants to know what our concerns are. But as he listens to them, we can leave them at his feet. We can leave them with him. We can be confident, not anxious about the future, but confident in God, whatever may happen, because God holds our prayers. And surely that puts a smile on our faces. That puts joy in our hearts. That produces a well of rejoicing and thanksgiving because God hears us, because God knows, and God holds our deep prayers of petition and thanksgiving. Following that command, not to be anxious, but to bring all our prayers, petitions, thanksgiving before God. Paul then goes on to bring his second promise. And the promise is this, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We desperately need peace. There's lots of circumstances and situations where many people will be crying out to God for peace. And this time of COVID and lockdown, second lockdown, is another time when we're asking for God's peace. And Paul's promise here is that God's peace can be received. And that peace is going to, once again, put a smile of joy upon our faces. But it's worth noting two things about this peace that Paul mentions. And the first thing is that this peace is miraculous. It's divine. It transcends all understanding. You can't manufacture it, you can't make it. It comes from God and God alone. And it's remarkable in the sense that in times when we should be anxious, in times when we should be worried, in times when there should be fear, that in God, because of his great grace, we might be at peace. It is a miracle that takes place in our lives. And the second thing that's worth noting is this, this peace is strong. It will guard your hearts and minds. Quite often when people use the word peace, it's got a sense of softness about it, quietness, of course. It's quite natural. But actually, in, in Paul's mind, it's a strong word. The word he uses here for guard actually can be translate, translated as garrison a garrison of soldiers or a garrison in terms of a fort. Something that is secure, something that is strong, something that is solid, something that will never be defeated. Isn't it great to know that as we trust God, as we place all our concerns upon him, he promises that his peace will descend upon us, that transcends all understanding, and that peace is solid, strong, secure and safe and will never ever be taken from us. So it'd be very easy to finish there and it feels like it's a finish doesn't it? The peace of God be with you, a bit of a benediction. But in danger of making the next few verses a PS it will be wrong to do so. Paul goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you, you have learned or received or heard from me or see in me, put it into practice and the peace of God will be with you. That word finally isn't the word finally that min, um, ministers and preachers using their sermons, although this is a final point from me. It is more a therefore following on from what has been said. 
if these things are to be true, if these things are to be right, then follow these on by doing these two other commands. The first one is to dwell on all that is good. If you're going to fill your hearts with joy, if you're going to fill your hearts with that sense of gentleness, if you're going to fill your hearts with God's goodness and presence, if you're going to come before God in petition and prayer, if you're going to know the fullness of his peace, miraculous and strong that it is, then think on all that is of God, all that is good, all that is excellent, all that is noble, all that is praiseworthy and true. And second command, don't forget. Don't forget what you have learnt, what has been passed on to you that is true and good. Keep learning from those early lessons of the faith that you might continue on in your journey. And as you do these two things, says Paul, if you follow these two promises, then he comes back to the second promise that he's just mentioned, but he just summarises it, and the peace of God will be with you. So that's my prayer for you, that you will know the joy of God this day, that you would rejoice in him, that your rejoicing will overflow in gentleness towards others, that you will know his presence today, but also the promise of his presence in the future, that you will bring all your prayers and petitions before him and not be anxious in your hearts and in your souls, but also that you will dwell on all that is good and learn from everything that is true of the past. And when you do those things, may the peace of God be with you. The miraculous, strong peace of Jesus. God bless you all and I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully in 2021.